Travis as he brings the scriptures and, and ministers to us through the word. It's in all these things that we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. your Bibles out. We're going to open them back up and, and start going through 1 Samuel chapter 1 here in just a sec. But uh, I, I absolutely love Mother's Day, and I think it's because uh, I've had the privilege of having so many amazing women in my life, from grandmother to mother, who is not able to be here today, and she was just telling me about how disappointed she was that she wasn't going to make it, but she's with family in Oklahoma, and then uh, my amazing wife, Jess, and for those that didn't know, God also blessed me with three sisters and no brothers, okay? So there's a prayer request for you, Garrett. I don't know, but for whatever reason, God has chosen to put some amazing, amazing women in my life, and uh, I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for it. But it also got me thinking about how we relate to our mothers differently throughout the seasons of life, right? When you're four years old, you think, mom can do absolutely anything. She's amazing. When you're 12 years old, you're probably thinking, mom is, is still awesome, but she doesn't know everything, right? When you're 14 years old, you get to the point of saying, Okay, now mom doesn't know anything. And when you're 18 years old, you think mom is so outdated and out of touch with reality, you don't even want to talk to her. And then at 25 years old, you start thinking, well, maybe mom does know some things. And then when you're 35, you get to the point where you say, before we decide on anything, let me get mom's opinion. And then when you're 45, you take it another step further, and you think, I wonder what my mom would do in this situation. And you tell yourself that over and over again. But then there's another point. When you turn 65, maybe it's when you realize, I wish that I could just talk to mom one more time. And so as we go through life, we have these different stages of life that are mothers and fathers and specifically mothers impact us in a way. And let me just say a word to those of you who are in that very last category. We as a church here have lost many, many saints in the last couple of years here. And it's a good word for those of you that are here today that maybe your loved one is not here. But we're going to study... Hannah today and see exactly how God is going to sustain her through very difficult circumstances. And I want you to be encouraged today that because you're here and maybe you don't have your loved one with you, that God knows exactly where you're at and he knows exactly what you're going through and he will sustain you through that season of time. But we must remain faithful to him. And that's really the story of Hannah that we're going to see here in just a minute. We're continuing on, as Garrett said, in our sermon series of impacting future generations. We've looked at Lois and Eunice, the mother and grandmother of Timothy. And we've also looked at Joseph the carpenter, the earthly father of Jesus. And today, we're going to study Hannah. And to set the scene up a little bit, it's important we know the context of 1 Samuel. So we know the story of the children of Israel. Moses led them out of Egypt Joshua took them across the Jordan River into the promised land. But Joshua gave them a warning. He said, don't let the book of the law depart from your mouth. And then we read in the book of Judges, they dropped the ball. There was a generation, it says, that didn't know the Lord. And in Judges chapter 17, verse 6, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. So that's the context that we're picking up here in Samuel. This was a very dark time in the nation of Israel. There was no peace. There was a lot of uh, sin going on everywhere. And there was no effective leadership. The leadership was even corrupt, as we're going to read here in a minute. Eli was the high priest at the time. His sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were worthless men, the Bible tells us taking advantage of the Israelites that were coming to worship the Lord there at Shiloh. But amidst all this chaos and uncertainty, God is at work through a lady named Hannah that's dealt a difficult hand 
But we're going to read about her faithfulness today. And hopefully you leave encouraged that no matter what you're going through, God is in control. God has a plan and he's going to see you through it. And all we need to do is be faithful with what he's asked us to do. It's a good reminder, too, that, uh, and really, if I could summarize this entire chapter into a sentence, it would say something like this. Success for us today, success for the believer, is not based on your circumstances. It's based on your faithfulness to God. I'm going to say that again. Success for the believer is not based on your circumstances that we find ourselves in. It's based on our faithfulness to God. So let me pray for us, and then we're going to walk through this chapter together. Lord, uh, we come to you today just so grateful to be here. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word and to study your truths. And God, we're going to read about Hannah and how it uh, really could be a snapshot of our lives, about difficult circumstances that we find ourselves in. And Lord, help us to see that you are with us even through the most difficult of things. And help us to draw closer to you through the studying of your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, let's start here. The first thing we're going to see is that Hannah's got problems. Hannah's got problems. Can anybody relate to that today? Is there any problems that you brought in here with you? Is there any problems in our world today? Don't lie and say no. <laughs> We've all got problems. But let's read in verse 1. Now there's a certain man from Ramathene Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeraham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. And here's the first problem we read in verse 2. He had two wives. That's a problem. You shouldn't have two wives. God tells us from the very beginning, marriage is between one man and one woman. And it's important to say, too, that anytime we find this in Scripture, it's a messed up situation. It's a messed up situation. We're going to learn here in just a minute why he has two wives, but that's the first problem. The other thing is, Jesus himself said, You don't serve two masters, right? Okay, nobody got that joke. I'm so <laughs> disappointed. I even asked Jess if it was worth saying, and she was like, Oh, yeah, you should say that. <laughs> Head at me like to... <laughs> okay, that was out of context. Don't send me emails. I know what Jesus was referring to when he said, don't serve two masters. Okay, that's, this is not it. Wake up. Wake up, guys. Okay. The name of one of his wives was Hannah. The name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. There's problem number two. Hannah was barren. And barrenness was a... Uh, a very big deal in those days because you would get your worth or your 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 your, your known you were known for your family hair. It was a big deal to pass down through the generations your family name. So being barren was actually grounds for divorce according to the old law. Uh, Psalm 127 said, "Children are a heritage from the Lord." So it was looked at is if you couldn't have children. You are not on the same socioeconomical platform as those that could. So we see Penina was able to have children. That's why Elkanah had the other wife, so he could reproduce. And I, it was interesting, I, as I was doing some research, one out of every eight couples today have infertility problems or can't have children at all. 12% of the adult population is infertile. That's over 7 million Americans. And I bet if we could go around the room this morning, we would hear testimonies of this happening. I know Jess and I had issues with it early on in our marriage. It's, it's a common problem. So it's not like this was an isolated incident. This is something that we all struggle with. And I just want to say to you today, if that's you, if you've struggled with that, your value to God is not based on your ability to reproduce. Okay, your value to God is not based on that. It's based on your faithfulness to Him. That's what He's asking us to do. So verse 3 says, Now this man, Elkanah, would go up from the city early to worship, to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. So we know that Elkanah is a godly man. He was doing his, his due diligence. He was going to church. And there were two sons of Eli, who was the high priest, Hophni and Phinehas, were the priests, to the Lord there. And it's interesting that it mentions this. It's just kind of a 
snapshot. It doesn't really have anything to do with the rest of chapter 1, but we read on in chapter 2, Hophni and Phinehas were worthless. They were taking advantage of the people. They were bad, bad people that were acting priests during the time. That just goes to show you the depraved state that Israel was in. And then verse number 4. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and all her son, and to her daughters. But Hannah, he would give a double portion. For he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. So here Elkanah is trying to do the right thing as, as the husband. He's going to give Penina and her sons and daughters all that they need. But Hannah, he would give double to. And I don't know if that compounded the issue or not, but he was trying to do the right thing, at least, right? But it's interesting here at the end of verse 6. It says, the Lord closed her womb. Have you ever stopped to think about that? What an amazing statement that is there. Sometimes God allows us to go through things because he's trying to get our attention. And I think that's what he was doing to Hannah here. He's like, Hannah, I've got something amazing prepared for you. Do you believe in me? Do you understand that I'm your only hope through this situation? We're going to see Hannah's reaction to that here in just a minute. But let's look at the third problem. Penina, number three, in verse seven. It happened every year as often as she went up to the house that she would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat. So Penina would provoke her. Like, ha ha, I can have kids and you can't. I mean, every, it says, every year when they went. This was a constant provoking that Penina would give towards Hannah. And it just compounded the issue. And, and it says that uh, she wept and would not eat. So the third problem is her uh, other husband's wife, Penina. And then she's got another problem, and it's Elkanah. Verse 8 says, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep, and why do you not eat, and why is your heart sad? Like, this goes to show a little bit of how clueless Elkanah is. She's sitting here weeping bitterly, crying profuse tears, and he's asking her these questions. Why are you sad? Hello, Elkanah. Do you not understand? Why aren't you eating? Why are you crying? And it, sometimes we need help, ladies, but this is a little extreme right here. And look what he says after that. Am I not better to you than ten sons? Like, what? Why are you saying this to her? It's like, baby, I know that you're sad, but look what you got. <laughs> Am I not better than ten sons or ten daughters? I just cannot understand why you're sad right now. Elkanah's a problem. Elkan is a problem. And then secondly, let's look at Hannah's prayer in response to her problem, starting in verse 9. Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat of the doorpost in the temple of the Lord, and she, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. So she gets up and she leaves and she goes there to the, to the priest, and you, you, you see Eli just sitting there watching the people as he does, and then she prayed to the Lord. But look at her response to Penina giving her a hard time. She didn't retaliate against Penina. She didn't say, yeah, but he loves me more, Penina. You might have the kids, but I get a double portion. She doesn't retaliate. She goes and she prays before the Lord. And then we see that she makes a vow in verse 11. She made a vow. Of host, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, I will give your maidservant a son and I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Now I know what that sounds like. It sounds like Hannah's bargaining with the Lord. If you do this, I will do that. Anybody ever done that? Yep. I see your hands raised. They're just like this and you can't see them. We all try to bargain with the Lord sometimes, but let me, let me pause for a minute and tell you why I don't think that this is what Hannah is doing here. At first glance, it could be a little confusing because the way that the text reads. But let me suggest that this was not Hannah bargaining with God, but rather her submitting to the will of God. And I say that because we know that Hannah is a righteous woman. 
She's a woman of prayer. She's a woman of meekness and humbleness. And there is no doubt that she has had many nights crying out to the Lord over this situation. But this is her way of submitting to God, saying, Okay, you got my attention, Lord. Here I am. I'm ready to fully submit to you. And Philippians, Paul tells us that we should make our requests known to God. And Hannah did this, praying to the Lord. Philippians chapter 4 says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Because when you do, here's what happens, it says in verse 6 and 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, or all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Make your request known to the Lord. That's why we had a prayer breakfast yesterday. We want to lift up the needs of this church to a holy God that promises to hear us. And he's acting. But we want to sur- submit ourselves to his will so that we're in lockstep with him and not doing something that he doesn't want us to be doing. And then at the end of verse 11, it says this strange little phrase. It says, a razor shall not come on his head. And we don't have time to fully unpack that, but it's a Nazarite vow from Numbers chapter 6. You can go look it up, and it's basically a vow of service to the Lord. Hannah's saying, I'm going to dedicate him to the Lord all the days of his life. The Nazarite vow actually had a time frame of a certain amount of years, but she's saying, Here, I'm going to go beyond that Nazarite vow. I'm going to dedicate him all the years of his life. And then in verse 12, it says, Now it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. So Hannah continued to pray. And Eli was just sitting there watching her, wondering what was going on. In verse 13, For as Hannah, she was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Eli's sitting there by the tabernacle, observing, and he thinks she's drunk. Again, it goes to the state of the lawlessness that was at the, during those times. There were drunk people all over the place. He just thought she was another one. And then Eli said to her, How long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, No, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. I answered and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way, ate, and her face was no longer sad. So Hannah found some kind of comfort. Eli, after recognizing that she wasn't drunk, gave her kind of a a cordial, Well, I hope it works out for you type of response. And then Hannah finally ate something that relaxed her a little bit and she was able to move forward in this. But we see in this section of scripture that Hannah prayed and that Hannah continued to pray. And we're going to see here in just a minute what God does with that. But let me just pause here for a second and say, isn't there something special about a praying mother? I know this is true in my own life. My mom prayed every single day for me, for my spiritual health. She prayed that God would do something great in our life, and she specifically prayed that God would make me a pastor. So it's her fault. If you want to blame somebody that I'm here, go blame her. She would love to hear from you, maybe. But there is something special about a praying woman in the home. Moms, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, sisters, daughters. Be a people of prayer. You can do it. You can do it. There's something special about a praying mother, a praying lady in the home. So we've seen Hannah's problems. They were many. We've seen Hannah's prayer. And lastly, we're going to see the promise that comes out of it, starting in verse 19. When they arose early in the morning and worship, then they arose early in the morning and worship before the Lord. Look at that. There we go. 
They arose early in the morning. Yesterday at prayer breakfast, Pastor Steve brought a wonderful uh, devotional on this very thing from the Psalms. It challenged, it was as the story of David was talking about how he would get up long before anybody else so that he could spend time with the Lord. And Jesus modeled this in his own ministry. You know how Jesus found alone time? It was because he got up before everybody else and went to the Lord. And that's what Hannah did here. They arose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. If you're struggling to find time in your own life, get up early. God will bless it, I promise you. In verse 19 begins this section with Hannah worshiping. And at the end of this chapter, we see that Samuel's worshiping. It's bookend by worship to the Lord. I just found that to be amazing on this section of scripture here. And returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife. And the Lord remembered her. Now that phrase is interesting too. And don't get caught up in thinking that God didn't remember something. That's not what it's saying here. It's not like God forgot that Hannah was there or her situation at all. No, this word is an action word. It's the Lord took action to what was going on in Hannah's life. And we can know that because of all the promises in Scripture. In verse 20 it says, And it came about in due time after Hannah conceived, and she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel saying, because I've asked him of the Lord. So the name Samuel, the Greek or the Hebrew root of that word means ask for or to ask is in that meaning of Samuel as a name. Verse 21, then the man Elkanah went up with his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah didn't go up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child and then I will bring him, and he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. So Hannah is basically saying, Elkanah, you go, you worship, you sacrifice to the Lord, but I'm not ready to yet because when I go to the temple, I'm leaving him, and he's not ready to be left yet. He's not quite ready to be left yet. So um, imagine being Hannah now for a minute. Uh, You had to think that she wanted to cherish every single second she had with that boy. And she didn't want to give him up too soon, but she, didn't, she still wanted to stay within the will of the Lord. But she was like, hey, Elkanah, you go. I'm not ready. And imagine that, being, being Hannah in that situation. What would you say to your son if you only had him for a short two to three years? Those were the things that Hannah was praying over Samuel, was talking to him about. What a sweet, sweet time that she was able to have with him in an emotional time. And then in verse 23, Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best for you. Remain until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she was weaned. So let Elkanah learn something. Remember, last time, he kind of said something that stick his foot in his mouth. And now he's saying, okay, no problem, Hannah. You keep the boy with you. I learned my lesson last time. You do what you want. And I'm going to go worship the Lord, and you come when you're ready. So you got to give Elkanah a little bit of credit there for learning, right? Then in verse 24, he said, Now when he was weaned, she took him up with a three-year-old bull, one ephah of flour, and a jug of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although although the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli and said, O my Lord, as your soul lives... My Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I've asked for. So I've also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. So a promise made is a promise kept. Hannah fulfilled the promise that she made to the Lord and dedicated Samuel to him. But we know that dropping Samuel off at the temple wasn't the end of their relationship. I want to encourage you to read ahead. This is a wonderful book of 1 Samuel. But in chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, we read this. Now Samuel was ministering before the Lord, and as a boy wearing a linen ephod, 
His mother would make him a little robe and bring it to him from year to year when she would come up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. How about that? So Hannah would go visit him once a year and she would make him a little robe to bring to him. How special is that? And imagine being Hannah during that year. Like, as she was making that robe, as she was doing, I wonder if it fits him this year. I wonder if I need to make it a little bigger. I wonder how long his arms are this year. Is the robe going to fit him? So here Hannah is. She's dedicated Samuel to the Lord. And yet she has a year in between visits to just think about, has he grown? How has he matured? And what a sweet thing to think about. But parents, it's a good word for us today, and grandparents alike. Cherish your time with your kids. It goes by so fast. It goes by so fast. You blink, and they're going to be in seventh grade next year. It goes by fast. Cherish the moments that God has given you with your kids and your grandkids, and make the most of it. Be intentional. Be the spiritual leaders in their life that they need you to be. And so by way of application, what can we take out of here? How can we take what we've learned through this story in 1 Samuel about Hannah? It's this. Success for the believer isn't based on our circumstances. It's based on our faithfulness to God. Every single person in this room came in with a different set of circumstances. Some of you are more difficult to deal with. Some of you may be less difficult to deal with. But every single person here has a unique set of circumstances that you're going with, going through. And let me tell you, none of those, none of those are are grounds for keeping you away from your relationship with the Lord. Faithfulness to God is not based on your circumstances. It's just based on your obedience to Him. We can see that Hannah went through some very difficult things. So I've got one question for you today. One question for you to think about. How is your faithfulness to God? How would you rate it on a scale of 1 to 10? How is your faithfulness to God today? If you're going through something difficult, have you stopped to think that maybe God's trying to get your attention? Maybe that just like Hannah's circumstances that he's trying to draw you close to him. I know one thing. He has something amazing. God's plan is something amazing for each of you. And I know that God's plan for this church right here is amazing. We've already seen him do some amazing things in a short time that we've been here even. So I'm excited to see where God takes us. But I want to challenge you today. How is your faithfulness to him? What is he asking you to do? And some of you might be here today and saying, I don't even know God. I don't even know this person you're talking about. And it starts there. It might start with you making a commitment to follow Him. The Bible's clear, folks. There is one way to heaven. And it's Jesus. Matthew 11, 28-30, Jesus asks this way. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you're bearing something heavy today, bring it to Jesus. He wants you to come. His, he will give you rest for your souls. That sounds pretty good. In the year 2023, in Baser, Kansas, in the United States of America, amongst all kinds of chaos going on, doesn't it? And let us be a people that have that message to send to this community. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your word. God, that it's inspired, that it's God-breathed, that you have recorded this for us so that we can learn how to live faithful lives how to be a faithful dad, how to be a faithful mom, how to be a faithful grandmother, grandfather, brother, sister, uncle, cousin, niece, nephew. Lord, let us learn from Hannah the difficult circumstances that she went through. But God, she gave it to you. And you were found faithful. 
And you promise us the same. So God, I pray for each person in this room, Lord, that whatever they're dealing with, God, that they would bring it to you, that they would bring it to the foot of the cross this morning so that they can find peace, so that they can find rest for their souls. And it's a peace and a rest that can only come from you because you alone are worthy. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we have a time of invitation here very briefly. Pastor Steve's going to be down front here. I'll be down front here. And we just want to...